All right, the uh, week five here, looking at um, God's faithfulness and how he fulfills prophecy. And uh, we're going to look at a little bit of the symbolism of the the feast, the Old Testament feast. It's not going to be an, a, a point by point overview, but there's definitely some symbolism in the feasts that uh, the Lord Jesus fulfilled. So if you want to turn to Leviticus, uh, chapter 16, we're going to start there. Chapter 16, we're going to start with verse 15. And, um, chapter 16, verse 15? Please. Correct. And we're going to read through 17. Now, again, if anybody's listened to a teacher that I know Peggy has, uh, you know, Chuck Missler, he'll, you know, really go in depth on how the feasts, the, the, the spring feasts were fulfilled by Jesus uh, in his first coming, the fall feasts will be fulfilled in the second coming. So <clears throat> in Leviticus um, chapter 16, it addresses some of the, um, the law and the atonement and different things that were taking place. And the atonement would happen in the fall, one of the fall feasts. And that would be the one day a year when the high priest would go in and offer a sacrifice. We call it, they call it the Day of, day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, um, but that's one of the, the one of the fall feasts. So, in chapter sixteen, verse fifteen, it says, "And he shall." This is speaking of the the priest. He shall slaughter a goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat in front of the mercy seat. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sin. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out so that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. So we see this high priest <clears throat> who one day a year gets to go in and go through the ritual of offering sacrifice for his sins and for the sins of his household and for the sins of the people. Now, if you would turn to Hebrews, keep your, put a marker in, in Leviticus. We're going to come back to that so it makes it easier for you. Um, we're going to turn to um, Hebrews chapter 9. Now we're going to look at Hebrews 9, 17, 7 through 14. And we're going to see how Jesus, functioning as our high priest, fulfilled the very, oh, what's the word I want, the very ritual that God required of the high priest in the Old Testament. We see Jesus as our, high, uh, our priest and king. Again, you've heard me say that Jesus is the only one allowed to fulfill both king and priest roles. You remember in the Old Testament there was a king. Um, I think it was eight. Well, it was one of two. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, so I'm not going to name them. There's two that come to mind. But there was one who followed the Lord until one day he decided he wanted to be priest too, and he goes in to the temple to offer sacrifices the priests tell him, don't do this. This is not your role. This is not for you. He continues in as if he's going to do it, and he breaks out in leprosy. And the priests see it, and they, they usher him out, and he willingly goes once he sees it. But he's leprous to the day that he dies. Uh, he has to hand over the kingdom to his son because he's unclean now. And he lives apart from the Lord. He's never allowed to enter the temple again. And even when he's buried, he's not buried with his fellow kings. Fellow kings. So... For a king to want to be priest is really taboo, okay? But Jesus is going to fulfill both the role of king and priest, okay? It sets him apart. That's also one of the unique things about Melchizedek in that he was a priest and a king. We looked at how Jesus was a priest in, uh, in accordance with uh, the order of Melchizedek. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, it says, um, that only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself or for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. 
The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way to the holy place had not been disclosed yet while the outer temple was, or outer tab tabernacle was still standing, <clears throat> which is the symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. Again, they had to do this annually, okay? So the sacrifice that, the, that was made on Yom Kippur is good for a year, okay? That's it. But, and that's a really important word, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this world or of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling um, those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we see the Lord Jesus functioning as our high priest, offering his own blood in heaven's tabernacle, in heaven's most holy of holies, and his sacrifice is superior in that it cleanses uh, sin once and for all, for all time for us, okay? And this is where a lot of Christians get a little confused. They keep thinking that they have to keep going to God for, for forgiveness and cleansing every time they sin. How many of your sins have been paid for? All of them, okay? The reason we go to God to seek his forgiveness isn't for relationship reestablishment, it's for fellowship reestablishment, okay? Our relationship with him is as his children. We've been cleansed, washed by the blood of the lamb, okay? We're his kids. Now, those of you that are parents, if your kid, who is your kid by birth, you're never gonna, that's never going to change, deceives you, lies to you, refuses to admit what they did wrong, and then all of a sudden they have a change of heart, they repent, they come, they say they're sorry. Are they saying they're sorry because they want to be your kid again? <laughs> they're saying they're sorry to restore fellowship, okay? Because, as you know, it's really hard to fellowship with a kid that's got an attitude and is unrepentant and is unwilling to admit what they did wrong. Okay? So for us as believers, when we come to the Lord seeking forgiveness, it's not a restoration of relationship. It's a restoration of fellowship. Okay? And, and in this case, Jesus, you know, made that possible for both. You know, now that we're restored to, fell to relationship with him, we can walk on with him knowing that his blood has paid the penalty for our sins. And it's not like Paul says, hey, may we sin all the more that grace may abound all the more. Paul says, oi, 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 may it never be. How can we who have died to, this, to the nature of sin, the power of sin, keep going there for life? The things of the flesh, the lust of the world, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, there's no life there. And once we realize that our life is found in Christ, those things take on a, a new perspective. We realize, oh, why, would I, why would I want to do that? Remember, it's the grace of God that teaches me to say no to ungodliness. It's not the law. It's grace that says, don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. You know, life is over here. Life is in Christ, following him, walking with him. And it all started because he was willing to fulfill that role of, of high priest and function not only as high priest, but the sacrifice itself. And it's cleansed our conscience. And praise the Lord for that. All right, now let's go back to Leviticus chapter 16. <clears throat> and we're going to look specifically at verse 27. And again, it's a, a little bit talking about the, the sacrificial system. Um, but I want you to pay attention to where it took place, okay? Leviticus 16, verse 27. 
but the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering, whose blood was brought to make atonement in the holy place, shall be taken where? Outside. Outside the camp. And they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuse in the fire. So the sacrifice was taken outside the camp. Now, <clears throat> you don't have to turn there, but let me just read to you Matthew 27, 33. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, the Golgotha was outside the city wall, okay? It was outside the camp. Where he was crucified was outside the temple was outside the camp. It's, it's an amazing place to go to. Some have been there. You literally see the eye sockets and as you can see why they call it the skull. What was the verse? Matthew 27, 33. Yeah, some of it as he wrote it, obviously. But he, if, it's a, if we can still see it today, imagine what it looked like in that time, you know. Um, but if you would turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, verses 11 and 12. Don't worry about it, Pat. Ignore it. They're leaving. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, 11 and 12. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Okay, that's again a better example. This is fulfillment of, of Jesus being the sacrifice. Okay. okay, the atoning sacrifice. If you want to refer to it as is Yom Kippur, yes. Yes, it, if your question is what they were doing was part of the Yom Kippur ritual, yes. But okay. for some reason I always thought they burned the fat and the meat and on the, until it's almost incinerated, but they do that outside of the temples? What you're this is the hide. All the stuff that wasn't part of, I mean, you wouldn't eat okay. the hide. Okay. okay. The, the, the guts, the intestines, and there are different parts of bodily organs that they would include but the awful, O-F-F-A-L, the stuff that you wouldn't want, to, it's, it's off, it's awful, so they would, awful, they would take it out and burn it up, okay, outside the camp. So Jesus, again, fulfilling that imagery as we see that in, in the sacrificial system, especially in Yom Kippur. Now, let's go back to Leviticus, but we're going to 17, Leviticus 17. Verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Okay, life is in the blood. Now I'm going to get really gross here. This is one of the reasons, and again, I'm, I deep dive on this stuff because of the nature of the work I do, <clears throat> but those involved in the occult have gotten much more, uh, what's the word I want? They're not hiding things anymore, not much, what they're doing. <coughs> and I think I shared with you in the past how they're, they're, um, they're drinking blood and promoting it as a, a youth elixir. They're drinking blood of young people, okay? Not, they wouldn't want mine, okay? They wouldn't want Rhea's, they wouldn't want Pat's, they wouldn't want anybody in this room because we're too old. They would believe, well, they prefer teenagers and children. Yeah, teenagers and children, okay? Um, and they are using kids that have been trafficked, mostly, um, and they're taking their blood and they're 
they're not hiding that they're doing this. They're promoting it as the next uh, fountain of youth elixir. Um, Does that to make uh, them live longer, give them yes. more energy and all that kind of stuff? Yes, they, okay. they, they call it some sort of health treatment. Yeah, because the life is in the blood, you I know. Mean, they're not sacrificing, they're just taking blood out? Or? <laughs> well, that's debatable. Um, yes and yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when they do do a human sacrifice, they will drain them and drink the blood as part of the ritual. It's disgusting, but that's it is what they do. Now that's not they're not being as overt about that. Okay, they're being overt about you know just taking it like you would at the Red Cross and then <coughs> taking the blood and, and and drinking it. Yeah. Oh. Satan will convince people to do a lot of bad stuff, you know, but he's mimicking and mocking God in the process. Okay. Um, it's a little bit too why our, oh man, I don't want a rabbit trail here. <sighs> FIFO, fi fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman, right? <laughs> Um, when you're dealing with the Nephilim, when you're dealing with the giants, one of the reasons why they were known for um, their powers and such would be that they would drink the blood of humans. Yeah. So it's this is a long-standing ritual, all the way back to Genesis six. Okay, um, drinking human blood. So. That sounds bizarre. I apologize. They, Satan is bizarre. So Matthew twenty six twenty eight. Is he? Tr he's trying to mimic us doing communion, which symbolizes drinking Christ's blood. Is that what he's trying to do, or or is that getting you on a rabbit trail? Yeah, that'll get me on a rabbit trail. Ask me afterwards. But um, Matthew twenty six twenty eight. Um, says, "For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out." for many for forgiveness of sins. This is the statement he makes at the Last Supper, you know, and we often will read that or what's in 1 Corinthians. And over in Luke 22, 20, at the Last Supper, it's stated that in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this is the cup which is poured out for you. Uh, this is the new covenant in my blood. Okay. The only blood that can give life is whose? Jesus' blood, okay? And, you know, again, when you're dealing with the Catholics, they believe in transubstantiation, okay? That through the prayer and the blessing that the wine literally gets transformed into a different substance, in the, the actual blood of Christ, which is why they venerate the cup so much and, and they literally believe in the communion that, that the wafer becomes the body of Christ. So you have to guard and and protect that wafer, and, you know, because when it's blessed, it's transubstantiated, it's changed across and turned into the, to the body of Christ. When we realize in our understanding of what Jesus meant here, he was talking pure imagery. I'm not saying that we should disrespect, you know, the process of communion, okay? Uh, what I'm saying is that these are symbols of what he did for us, that there is, and we love, I wish we had sung the song Power, Power in the Blood. Mm -hmm. There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood That's of the right. Lamb, you know, and it's the only blood that really is powerful, okay? It brings life. Every other ritual that we just kind of vaguely discussed brings death, not life, okay? And um, there's quite a difference. All right, over in Mark, chapter 10, um, we're talking about the life atonement for Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, proving that his lifeblood was able to atone. You don't have to turn here, but just a couple of verses we're familiar with. 
10, 45. Um, Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 4. For all of sin falls short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So all of us have needed that redemption, right? And it's by His gift, the giving His life, that we get that grace which brings redemption. Um, 1 John 1, 7 says it very clear. If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, what? Cleanses us from all sin once and for all. And it's only His blood that's able to do that. And again, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, no matter what feast you're looking at required a sacrifice, Jesus is fulfilling all of those, all the symbolism in each of those feasts. And we've taken time in the past to look at that, but the atoning sacrifice of Yom Kippur was done once and for all for Jesus. And it's going to be exciting for the Jews, sort of. It's going to be a real bad time in history, but it's going to be really exciting when, as a nation, their eyes are open and they get it. And they get that they don't have to have their temple. They don't have to do Yom Kippur. Why? Because it is what? Finished. It's done. Once and for all. All right, go back to Leviticus. We're going to chapter 23. Leviticus 23. Uh, that's a good question. Verse 37. Leviticus 23, 37. These are the appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. He's referring to the different feasts early. You know, he's gone through all the different feasts to present offerings by fire to the Lord, burnt offerings, grain offerings, drink, I'm sorry, sacrifices, and here's the emphasis, and drink offerings, each day's matter on its own day. I want to focus on the drink offerings. They would literally take the wine or whatever it was, or the oil or whatever it is, usually wine of some sort, that they would pour out on the altar. It's, it's God's way of having communion and fellowship and enjoying a meal. He would participate by, you pour out the offering as if it was the Lord, for the Lord to drink and participate with. That was the imagery. Um, but the sacrifice. Now, John chapter 7, verse 37. Again, you just let me read it for sake of time. Now, on the last day, the, the high day, the great feast day of the feast, Jesus stood up. This is, again, he was in Jerusalem. It was a feast day. It was the high day of the feast, the most important day. Most of these feasts last seven days. And that culmination of the sacrifices on that day, he stands up and he cries out to everyone to hear, if anyone is thirsty, what? Let him come to me and what? Drink. He was the drink offering. You know, as he offers the wine at the Last Supper, you know, it's symbolic of a drink offering. He was the drink offering. Uh, I'm going to push through this one real quick here. Numbers, go, Leviticus, you know, is followed by the book Numbers. Um, if you would turn to Numbers chapter 21, this is just a little interesting thing. Now, this to set this up, Israel had started to complain. There's a shock. They were wandering in the wilderness. Um, God was providing the manna, but kind of like with the Keith Green stuff we were talking about, they were complaining. And uh, they were just tired of wandering around in the wilderness. And, and uh, so the Lord sent a bunch of snakes into the camp. And that would, do, that would be enough right there to, to hate snakes, okay? Um, and they were killing, they were biting people, and people were dying. And so they cry out in repentance. And he instructs Moses in, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9. Moses made a bronze serpent 
and he set it up on a standard. Now, some people say that standard was a cross like thing and coiled with snake around it. And it came about that if a serpent had bit anyone, when he looked to the bronze serpent, now it's interesting, the bronze is always symbolic of judgment, okay, of the metals. When you see bronze, think judgment, okay, judgment of sin. When he looked up to the bronze serpent, he lived. This is why also, too, when you go to a, a pharmacy, believe it or not, the apothecary, the symbol with the serpent, that's where it came from, okay? <clears throat> is it the same symbol, the medical symbol? Yes. Like if there's two snakes, it's a totally different symbol. Oh, really? Yeah. What is that? If it's two snakes, what's that mean? It's actually a sign for um, business and profit. Oh. Really? Yeah. Huh, did not know that. <clears throat> All right, John chapter 3, uh, verse 14. And Moses lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Okay, that's going to resonate with a Jew in a huge way. This is John chapter 3, which means, and it's verse 14. So it's two verses prior to John 3, 16. So who's he talking to? He's talking to Nicodemus, okay, a Pharisee, a student of the law. Nicodemus is going to remember the bronze serpent from Moses, okay? Now, later on in Israel, after Moses did this, they wound up worshiping this stupid thing. They called it Nehushtan. Okay, and um, one of the, Hezekiah, the king Hezekiah, who was a good guy, uh, winds up destroying it because Israel had turned it into an object of idolatry. Okay, but Jesus pointing to this bronze serpent tells Nicodemus, a Pharisee, hey, look, just like the, the Israelites had to look to this to live, I'm going to be lifted up. And when people look to me, they're going to have eternal life. Okay, they're not going to be healed from a snake bite. I crushed the serpent. Okay, I'm going to top this thing. I'm going to do a lot better than that, that serpent on the pole thing. Okay, and in, verse, uh, in chapter 12 of John, verse 32, he goes on and says, And if I am lifted up, or since I will be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Okay, and so again, we see Jesus fulfilling these imagery, these prophetic images that were declared in the Old Testament, God being faithful to give these word pictures throughout history for Jesus to be the one who fulfills it. So again, when you, you I don't know the statistics of it. Uh, I, I, I had statistics more than one occasion in college. I was not a fan of statistics because it involved numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that statistically what I've been told that, that Jesus, for Jesus to, for one man to fulfill all of these things, even just a few that we've talked about over these past few weeks, it is statistically impossible for one man to fulfill as many. I think there's over 800 or 900 prophecies of Messiah and for Jesus to get them all is statistically impossible without it being planned or told ahead of time again because God is above time he can tell us ahead of time what's coming this is why we know that the rapture is next this is why we know Ezekiel 37 38 are going to happen, or 38 and 39, 37 has already happened, 38 and 39 are going to happen the way they, that he says it is, where these nations are going to gather against Israel, and they're going to come to battle and take the spoil, and God's going to be the one who intervenes and he's going to pulverize them, that the world may know that he is God, and there is no other, you know, 
um, and that we know that there's going to be a, a period of seven years where, you know, after we're out of here, there's going to be a really bad time. But after that seven years, what? We come back with Jesus and we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to get there. I want to be at the wedding feast. I don't know about you guys. All right. We serve an amazing Savior whose capacity to atone and pay for our sin is unparalleled. There is no other. And thank you, Lord, for his shed blood. Let's close in prayer. Indeed, Father, thank you so much that you use the Lord Jesus to fulfill those prophetic images of the feasts. Thank you that he was indeed lifted up for us and that because we have looked to him, we've been drawn back to you. We've been atoned for, we've been cleansed once and for all. We're now your children. What a precious gift that is. I pray for an opportunity for us to share the gospel through the week. I pray that many more would come to faith this week. And Lord, that you would just come soon. Come get us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>